Let me, Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. Today, as we focus in your word and the subject that we're talking about, our desire is that we learn from you, that we be challenged by your word, that this isn't just a Sunday where we come and we have sung some songs and we have heard a message to be challenged by and we walk out and we think, okay, I've done my service to God, I'm all done. Our desire today is that something has changed, that a revival would break out into our heart, that we would get serious in our relationships with you. And that's our, uh, uh, that's our focus. And that's the purpose, my purpose, the purpose of many who are here today as we look into your word. So as we are challenged from your, from your Holy Scripture, Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts to obey in Jesus' name. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I will give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus knew specifically God's will, and exactly what to do. He reveals it to us. This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last days. In a prayer to the Father, Jesus said, I have glorified you on earth, and I have finished the work which you have given to me to do. The things that matter to God matter to Jesus. The things that matter to God became Jesus' top priority. So can I ask you a question? It's in regard to your inner motivation. Can you honestly say that you are open to God's direction? in regards to a given matter? Do you have an accepting mind and heart that is submissive to God's desire, to God's word, to God's authority, to God's timing? See, there's a process of making godly decisions. And it starts in our heart. As we seek to glorify God by asking ourselves, how can I please and honor God? How can I please and honor my Lord in this situation? We begin by searching the scripture for specific commands that influence our choices, the choices that we are considering. And those choices that we are considering are plastered all around you in this room. You can't help but notice the one another signs everywhere. Because these one another signs are commands. And each one is different. Some may have some overlap, but there are numerous one another commands found throughout the Bible. They are not suggestions. They are not recommendations. They are not proposals but instructions for the believer to honor God. 
How does this work? Well, that's what we're going to find out over the next coming weeks as we discover each week and then we examine each one of these one anotherisms or one another commands. And this week we're going to start off with how to love one another. How do you love one another? If you're in your Bibles in John chapter 13, we look at this first command. It's not first as in like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. It's not number one in that order. It's not the first one another command that's listed in chronological order of the Bible. It's only first because that's the first one I chose. But it's also the first one in a sense that out of this love command, every one of the other ones seems to have a string attached to it. If you're loving one another, serving and fellowship and accepting and patience and honoring, not slandering and sympathizing with and peace with and kindness, love seems to be connected to all of them. Wow. But in the command to love one another, as Jesus has stated to his disciples in chapter 13, verse 34, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I loved you. That you also love one another. Why do we need a command to love one another? Really? I mean, th this statement seems like a platitude. Hey, love one another. If we look into the, the specifics of what's taking place here, some background information of what's going on with the disciples. Now remember, these guys have been with Jesus for three and a half years. They're an inner group. Jesus has spent some time with them. And he's telling them to love one another. You might think, yeah, that's, that should be how it is. But you have to ask yourself, why is he telling them this? What's the circumstance that has come up? Well, if you read chapter 13 at the beginning, you find out some interesting things that have taken place. One, you have the foot washing. And we're going to talk about that when we get to serving one another. But that's taking place. But you go to Luke chapter 22. Go to Luke chapter 22. Put your bulletin in, in John, so you don't lose your place. But if you go to Luke chapter 22, verse 24. And really quick, if you skip up ahead before 22 you'll see that the Lord institutes the Lord's Supper, communion. And at communion time, hey, that's a pretty holy time, very reverence time, right? He institutes the very first communion with his disciples. He's just had dinner with the disciples. Now all of them are together. And remember, he's had, he's had the foot washing. They've had supper together. He institutes this whole communion thing with them. And verse 24, this is right after, they're still in the upper room. And there rose a dispute among them, verse 24, as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Do you see what's going on? A spiritual moment had just taken place, and now the disciples are arguing, who's the best among them? Who's the greatest? Is it Peter? Is it John? Is it Andrew? Who should be first? They were just at a spiritual high spot. Now we know it's not Judas because he's left the room. So the group that's in there now are jockeying for position. Who's the best among them? And Jesus responds to them. Guys, I want you to love one another. Now, you might be asking yourself, how is this a new command? How is loving one another a new command? Especially as you, as you search the scriptures and you realize that this is not a new commandment at all. Or you might be asking yourself, in what way can this be a new commandment? Well, if you've got the Old Testament and you've got the New Testament, 
So anything in the New Testament must be new, right? No, that's not how it works. These titles of new and old just aren't thrown on there to identify something that's old and something that's new. If you go back to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, go ahead and do that. It's okay to use your Bible. And if Leviticus, if you just turned to that and dust flew off of there, because these pages are ancient and you've never been in there for a while, that's all right. Leviticus 19, verse 18, check this out. This is important because this is some of the basic material that the disciples knew. They were taught this as children. And you'll see why I say, as Jesus is laying out, is this really a new commandment? In 19, verse 18, he says, Thou shalt not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So the law teaches the children of Israel, the Jewish people, you are to love your neighbor as yourselves. Wait a minute. You've heard that phrase many, many times over and over again. Jesus taught the disciples the same thing in Matthew chapter 12, in Mark chapter 12, excuse me. He teaches them that many times over. In fact, when Jesus is challenged, what's the greatest of all the commandments? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with with all your strength. I'm leaving one of those out. He says, the second is just like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you've done these two commandments, you have fulfilled the law in its entirety. See what I mean? When you fulfill love, you tie everything in. So not only did the disciples know about the importance of loving one another from the Old Testament law, Jesus had affirmed this throughout their ministry. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Great. Anybody doing that today? It's hard. We like to change that. Do it to your neighbors before they do it to you. That's the motto. Get them before they get you. So how does that work? Well, Jesus has a command which is targeted towards a specific group. Go back to John 13, verse 34. It says, a new commandment I give to you. This command is specific towards a people group. I've never noticed this before. Oftentimes I hear this and I just read it and think, oh, that's just to everybody. Love one another. Yeah, okay, we're all supposed to do that. But Jesus is targeting us towards a very specific group of people, the disciples and them alone. Now, you can make the application to all of us. Yes, but hold on. Let's let's focus our attention on this group of people who are having a hard time loving one another. Why is it when we look at the disciples and their makeup, who made, who made up the disciples? Who were these men? You had a tax collector. One of the most despised and hated people in the nation. And he's part of the 12. You also have a zealot. Zealots were known for carrying little knives. And the first chance that they got to either kill a Roman soldier or even a tax collector, they were fond of coming in behind and stick him in the back with a knife, a dagger. So he's part of the group. You've got Judas, who is a thief. We know that afterwards. He was probably skinning money off the top. So you've got a group of people who you think, oh, the 12. The 12 disciples, they were as holy as can be. No, they were a rotten group of men, saved by grace. I don't mean to, I don't mean to cause any of you to have your views of the, of the 12 looked down upon, but look, these were just regular guys. And they had a hard time getting along. And they fought between themselves. It wasn't the first time that John and James had their mother say, say hey, um, Mom, can you like figure out and talk to Jesus and, and make sure that we're on the right hand, the left hand of your throne? There is politicizing going on to see who can be number one with Jesus when he comes into power. And when the other group hears about this, it creates confrontation. This happens again and again and again in a small group of people. 
So when Jesus says, I want you guys to love one another, I want this small group of people, 12, I want you to love one another. That's the group he's targeting. That's the group he wants to love one another. I want you guys to love one another. Hmm. Is that even possible? How is that going to work? How can these 11 men at this time love one another? The command is not based on the law principle. Because if this law was based on the, on the law principle, it would be filled with blessings and curses. If you were able to love the other guys, then great blessing would come along with it. But if you didn't, then you'd be cursed. It's, the command is now modeled after Jesus. Jesus' love for his followers was to be their model to love one another. He says, I, lo- I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Wow. See, how is this a new commandment? It's a new commandment because it's based on a new model. Jesus is that new model. They've always been told to love their neighbors, to love other people. But now the model is set up to where the standard is love one another the way Jesus has demonstrated, has modeled love. But that's, to be honest, I've got to ask you, ask you the question, what does that even look like? What does Christ's love look like? Because we're talking about something that happened 2,000 years ago. What does the love of Christ look like? Or you might ask, how does Jesus love me today? How am I receiving the love of Jesus? Well, first of all, begins with Jesus' love is always relational. I don't have a big, long list of things, and I'm sure there's plenty of other people to do, but Jesus' love has always been relational. God's love is always relational. From the very beginning, it's been relational. In the Garden of Eden, it starts off with Adam and Eve, they sin, and they hide in the garden. And God shows up and says, hey, Adam and Eve, where are you? Oh, we're hiding because, yeah, I know why you're hiding. Come out. Sin always keeps us separate from God. And their first children, Cain and Abel, when Cain doesn't bring the right sacrifice to God, God comes into Cain's life and says, Cain, if you do what's right, won't it go well with you? Ah, see, there's the temptation. And then we find out a few Sentences later, that Cain kills his brother Abel. And God comes on the scene again and says, Cain, what's what's going on? What did you do? And Cain makes excuses. See, God is relational. God is constantly initiating the relationship. Even after people are sinners. In Matthew chapter 4, Verses 18 to 22, we see that Jesus chose the disciples. And he says, follow me, for I will make you fishers of men. They didn't choose him, but he chose them with a purpose and a plan for their life. In John 15, verse 16, he says, I have chosen you. You haven't chosen me. We might be surprised at least somewhat, when we, when we realize from Romans chapter 3, there is, no, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understand God. There's none who seek after God. So from mankind's perspective, no one is trying to have a relationship with God, but God is continually trying to have a relationship with us. Make no mistake, Jesus wants to have a relationship with us. Jesus wants to have a relationship with every person in this room. Everyone in this room, he desires to have a relationship. Regardless of the circumstances that you've gone through, regardless of the sin that's in your life currently or what you've done in your past, it doesn't matter. He wants a relationship with you. And for those of you that have a relationship with him, he wants a much deeper relationship than you already have. He wants to go further and deeper than what you currently have. See, 
Christ's love looks like a relationship. But what type of relationship? The relationship that he gives us one is that between him and his father. That's really the picture. There's constant unity between him and his father. There's never arguments or disagreements. There's complete unity all the time. And that's something that he is trying to draw the disciples into. So there is complete unity. Doesn't mean there's never going to be a disagreement. But there's unity. It's also Christ's love looks like sacrificial. Now I know that all of you who have been to church more than once in your life know that Christ died on the cross and he rose again from the dead. That type of sacrificial but let me get more practical and sacrificial for us. What do I mean by sacrificial? I mean Jesus spent time with his disciples. He took time out of his own life to be with his people. Three and a half years he spent with them, day in and day out. That's sacrifice. If you're going to love somebody, you've got to be willing to pour your life into someone else. You've got to sacrifice your time for them. Was there ever a time that Jesus wanted to be alone? Why do you think he wanted to be alone? To pray? Do you think he ever got kind of tired of the whining of the crowds or disciples? I mean, come on. I know you're, well, he's God. Okay, but it gets a little old hearing people whine and complain about the same thing over and over again. And sometimes he takes them to task. If you're going to have sacrificial love, you've got to spend time with people. Second, Second, he's teaching them. In the effort of teaching the disciples, they already know the Old Testament, but he's teaching them the heart issues of the Old Testament. In other words, he's taking it to a different level. I don't want to say he's making it spiritual. He's showing, look, here's what's lying underneath of it. Here's the heart of God. Here's the why of all of this. Why we love the Lord our God. And he's bringing it to a, back to a relational attitude. And while he's teaching them, he's recognizing it's going to take time for this stuff to sink in. How many times did he tell the disciples, I'm going to go die on the cross? Once? Twice? Three times? Twelve times? I'm running out of fingers. And it doesn't matter how many times he told them, we know from Scripture, it wasn't even until after he was resurrected from the dead did they get it. Because remember when he was dead, they were all hidden behind closed doors, locked, and they were scared to death. And then finally someone comes knocking on the door. The body's not there. You know, it takes time for people to grow and to get that information. That's sacrificial. It takes time to allow a person to go, uh, uh, to allow someone to be wrong and still be with you. Third thing is rebuke. Sometimes Jesus rebuked the disciples. He corrected them when they needed it. Don't get the false picture of Jesus that he never dealt correctively with disciples because he did. When the disciples thought that they wanted to pour, call down fire from heaven and wipe everybody out, he dealt with them strongly. When Peter wasn't on the same track that Jesus was going on, he said very strongly, get thee behind me, Satan. Whoa. You're not on the same track with Jesus. You're not following where he's going. It's pretty strong to talk to disciples. So Jesus wasn't afraid to rebuke them. To get them back on the right track. Sacrificial means you have to be willing to tell the truth to your followers. And recognize that maybe your followers are going to jet out the door. They're not going to follow you anymore. And you know that happened. Some found the truth hard and no longer followed them. Wow. What does Christ's love look like? Relational, sacrificial. 
He also encourages. He tells the disciples, you're going to be doing greater miracles than the ones that you saw me do. But he's also very helpful. He's engaging in their personal lives. Remember Peter's mother-in-law. She was sick. And he goes and he heals her. He cares about the family situations. He cares about each of them individually. And when there's a complaint about Jesus paying taxes, remember Peter probably didn't have the money for the taxes either, so Jesus pays for Peter's taxes too. Here, go out and fish. Go find the money in the fish's mouth. Oh, okay. Great. So he covers the money for both. Jesus is constantly rescuing them, feeding them, protecting them, even at the very end at the Garden of Gethsemane. They all could have been arrested, but Jesus proclaims that I am, and everyone falls back, and he is the only one taken into custody. Do you think the disciples knew that Jesus loved them? Yeah, I think so. Now let me ask you, think for a minute, in your own relationships, in what ways are you loving as loving as Christ loved? Mentally, you can just make a check. Do you want to be served rather than serve? Just say, I want to be first rather than be last. I want more than others rather than less. I want to be honored rather than looking for opportunities to honor others. I want to be the center of attention rather than giving attention. I want what I want now rather than making sure that others' needs are met first. If you say you love others, what does your lifestyle say? Are you willing to serve others when when you're not given public recognition? Would you say that you are actually looking for opportunities to be a servant? Would you say that you are actually praying for other Christians at least as much as you're praying for yourself? Would you say that you're willing to become involved in other Christians' lives? Are you willing to say that you are willing to share a significant portion of your money so that the body of Christ can function adequately? Are you willing to say that you are practicing hospitality? No. Last point. How to make God's love visible. What's the master plan to attract others? Verse 35, after giving the new command to disciples, Jesus says, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When we think of Jesus' master plan to attract others, this is nothing more than evangelism. And I've really never considered this as his master plan for evangelism. And I'm not about to jump into an an idea of, here's evangelism 101. But it really makes sense how attractive it would be for people to see people loving one another. People come to know of his love through Christians in their proper relationship with one another. John, 1 John says, in chapter 4, verse 11 through, through 12 says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. That was put into practice in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, when 120 of them were gathered together in a room, and people saw that love, as the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them, and thousands of people became believers. Does it work? This works every time when people are willing to love one another. When people are willing to 
be identified the way that Christ loved one another. One of the most challenging things I think that we face is do we believe God's word? Do we trust God's word? Will we take a step of faith and say, I will, I recognize God's word to be true, and I'm going to follow God's word, and I'm not going to rely upon anything else. God's saying his word is going to spread as non-believers, unbelievers, see Christians loving one another as Christ loved them. That will attract others. We live in a very loveless world right now. But people need to see Christians, how Jesus loved them, how we love one another. Because they'll want to know what makes us different. What makes us unique. Why do we care about the things that we care about? Why are we willing to help one another out when we're not family or maybe we're not blood related? We're only related through Jesus Christ. That goes beyond logic, beyond reason. So how does this work at FBC? For the time that I have left, if asked if we love God, the answer would be, yeah, I think if I were to ask you individually, do you love God? Do you love God? I think all of you would say, yes, yes. But if I were to ask you if we love people, the response might be a little bit more guarded. Which people? Which people are you talking about? You know, generically, I love all people. But specifically, I may not love certain people. All right, let's get specific. Do you love the people in this room? I'm not asking you to nod your head or make a vocal command. I'm just laying a question out to you. Do you love the people in this room? All right. Do the people in this room feel loved by you? See, that's a little bit different. That's a question that we go back By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You may feel that you are loved in this room by people, but the other side of that coin is, do the people in this room feel loved by you? It's easy to love people that are just like us just like us socially, just like us in our hobbies, just like us in our wherever we're at in life. But the kind of love that Jesus is talking about is to love people that rub us the wrong way. The people that go against our grain. The people that get underneath our skin. You know, the people that irritate us. That just after a few seconds you're like, If I could call a lightning bolt down to whack you upside the head, I would do it. And we're not talking about a spouse or a family relative. We're talking about people in this room. I'm not talking about a neighbor. I'm talking about the people here. Why am I talking about the people here? Because that's what the passage is talking about. It's talking about loving one another. It's the disciples, a small group of men who Jesus says, I want you guys to love one another. And we are a reflection of that small group. And as we start loving one another, the whole world, the whole area that we're trying to communicate with will recognize that there is something unique about us. Because we're following the Lord Jesus Christ. This is it right here. If we're going to be obedient to Jesus Christ, if we're going to be obedient to the command to love one another, we're going to love one another as he did and we can't stand where we are hoping that that person somehow is either going to move away or God's going to change them 
we must make a decision to obey or disobey. I remind you that Jesus loved the traitor, that he betrayed him with a kiss. You may not have been betrayed. You might just have to put up with some things that you don't like. But if we're going to love one another, I'm going to ask you to get out of your comfort zone and make a decision today to follow Jesus Christ and say, I'm going to love one another. Not because it's comfortable, not because it's easy, because that's what Jesus has commanded me to do, and I'm going to do that. I'm more concerned about following him than my own personal discomfort. Let me leave you with three challenges. You can write them down on a piece of paper. You can scale. One to five is a scale. One being little, three being some, five being much. Evaluate yourselves. I'm not going to be looking at these, although I'd like to, but I won't. First challenge. To what degree are you committed to obeying Christ's command to love one another? A little, one, two, three, four, five. Three is some, five is much. To what degree are you committed to obeying Christ's command to love one another? That's the first question. Second question. Same thing. Give, your, give yourself a number. To what degree would you say that you are reflecting true love and unity? To what degree would you say you are reflecting true love and unity? Last, to what degree are you participating in building up the body of Christ in love by faithfully practicing one another commands? To what degree are you participating in building up the body of Christ in love by faithfully practicing one another commands. Now that you've just evaluated yourselves, if you've got one, two, or three, maybe today's the day to challenge yourself and commit yourself and say, Lord, I just need to follow your commands and start obeying you. A new command I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. Are you his disciple? The evidence is found in your action. Let's pray. Father, again, we just thank you for our time together. Thank you for your word the opportunity that we have to look into your truth and reveal what's really in our hearts. We are challenged by what we've, what we've heard, and we know we need to make some changes. And we rejoice in what you reveal to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Brian?